Welcome back to the Forest Car Show. And now, as promised, I do have a guest on the line who's uh, going to help us um, figure out which party to join. Right now, I belong to a group of people who would be the largest party in the state if it were to declare a party, independent voters. And uh, no particular reason, but when I moved to Arizona uh, to take over a television newsroom operation here in town three and a half years ago, I decided, or actually it's four years ago now, I decided that it would be best for me not to declare a party loyalty because parties were getting so, the, the political atmosphere was getting so polarized that uh, I wanted to be able to say to viewers with a very straight face, look, I'm nonpartisan. So I still haven't declared. And this is sort of the week, we started last week with the Republicans. And now I have a Democratic Party Chair, Pima County Democratic Party Chairman Don Jorgensen on the line with us. Thanks, thanks so much for joining the show this morning. How are you doing today? Um, great, Forrest. It's a pleasure to be on. Thanks. Good to have you on. So tell me the question that I asked last week and the question I'm asking now. I, if I'm going to pick a party to join, which party should it be? And of course, I, I anticipate you'll say the Democrats. So why should it be the Democratic Party? What What is the benefit to me for joining the Democrats? Uh, we, we have a lot to talk about. Um, you know, quite simply, you can make more of a difference as a member of the Democratic Party, I believe, than, than any other. And we can talk about the independents. It's you know, as to in terms of being a bigger party, because if you want to see fireworks, that's where it would be. But the, the difference with the Democratic Party, and I'm speak positively because I agree with you. There's been much too much polarization, um, and not just in Washington. We've seen it in the Arizona legislature. We've seen it certainly uh, within the media, uh, and, and for a lot of different reasons on the air. Uh, but because you can make a difference. Uh, and the primary reason, I think, in the Democratic Party that you can make a difference is that we value diversity. And when I talk about diversity, I am not just talking about cultural or ethnic diversity, which is what most people think about, but diversity in terms of age. Uh, we, there's a place for young people to actually have a voice and be active, and there's a lot of that happening, particularly in the Arizona Demo Democratic Party and here in Pima County, too. Uh, we value gender. Uh, you, you can have a voice. We protect and work hard for equal rights for, for all, for women's reproductive rights, for individual rights, to be able to marry who you love, um, to protect against discrimination. Uh, you know, we, have, we value diversity in religious beliefs. You know, we, it's, a, it's a big tent party in practice, not just in talk. And I know both parties say a lot of the same things, but I think when you look at what we do and whether we practice what we preach or what we believe in, I think you can really see that in the Democratic Party. Yeah, I think we have perhaps a greater capacity to learn from our mistakes. And there's certainly been mistakes made in, uh, in looking at how to move forward, but uh, we deal with it. The other comment I'll make, and I know you have a lot of questions, and uh, I want to answer sure, those. Sure, go ahead. We'll, we'll get to it. We'll got, I got as much time as you do. <laughs> if you so. Okay. Go ahead. You know, we, we also believe much, I think, more strongly in investing in the future and not the past. Uh, again, we hear from the other party about going back to the good old days. Well, you know, those good old days were only good for uh, white, rich folks. Um, we want to invest in the future for everyone. So I think Democrats are much more adept at changing with the issues and with the times. You know, we're dealing much more now with privacy rights, uh, with LGBT rights, with, with immigration reform, with technology and science. And, and, I, and I think you see a more open-minded party in dealing with all those issues, really at the ground level. Um, so that's, those are kind of the direct answer to the question. Uh, in terms of what we believe in, as I'm saying, we believe in inclusion, and we respect differences of perspective and belief, all wrapped in fighting for what we believe are the three keys. And, and you can put, I think, any issue into these values, and those are values of protecting freedom, individual freedom, uh, protecting security and opportunity. But that's really where the Democratic Party is focused today. Okay, well, let me—and let me, uh, and great, thank you for that explanation— let me tell you, it was roughly at this point in the conversation last week that I had with a Democratic, with a Republican Party uh, chairman, uh, Carolyn Cox, where I said that, you know, one of my concerns as an independent is that none of the parties really has a, a platform that speaks to everything I believe in. So my, at my particular stance as an independent, but there are, you know, and I don't speak for any other independents, except I will point out that independents are generally thought to be more middle of the road. 
I'm middle of the road. My politics are middle of the road. I'm not, I'm not extreme to the left. I'm not extreme, extreme to the right. And my hesitancy about joining the Republican Party is that although I believe in many of the things that Republican Party uh, says it believes in, uh, I believe in some things that it doesn't. And you mentioned um, fighting for women's rights. You mentioned fighting for, for gay rights. My feelings along those lines are more Democratic in their leaning. So, right. so let me just ask you this question. If I were to join the Democratic Party, and I believe in some of the things you believe in, like women's rights, like gay rights, but I also tend to be very suspicious of, of what has become an entitlement nation and things like that are more, uh, more in line with what the Republicans preach. If I come to you into your big tent, would I be welcome? And, and would there be a place for me to uh, express my views and, and, a, and a way to, to fight for those within the Democratic Party? Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. Because our response isn't, oh, you don't believe like us, then, you know, be gone. Our response is, all right, if you have some different beliefs, explain them to us. Uh, help us understand your position and how you think a different approach might be effective. Because we're looking for solutions. And anyone that comes in and, and says, here's a better way to do this, we're open to it. You know, And I say that from experience, because... I think what's happened with both parties is that the extremists on both parties get the headlines. You know, it's more entertaining. And, and you know more about the media and how the media operates than I do. I was going to bring up this very point, but uh, please yeah. please continue. We'll, well, I, this is definitely something I want to talk about. Yeah, and, and so, you know, the Tea Partiers get the attention, and, and they yell the loudest. And sometimes it is that the people yell the loudest, and it's usually the extremists. You'll see within the Democratic Party, pretty probably a majority that believe in fiscal responsibility and uh, progressive social values. And that's really what I see as the majority. Now, there, there's kind of a continuum of uh, those progressive beliefs. You've got uh, what folks would be called conservative Democrats and progressive Democrats. Uh, but I challenge you to find anyone on the other side who would call themselves a liberal Republican. You know, they're tarred and feathered. These yes, days. they are. They're run right out of the party. And we discussed that last week. I discussed that in detail yeah. with, with Carolyn Cox. And she assures me that the party is becoming more inclusive. But then, of course, she had to admit that they do have elements of their party that blacklist other Republicans and try to run them the hell off. So uh, yeah. I, I, um, <laughs> uh, I think that the Democratic Party, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. It traditionally has been a big tent party. But on the subject of extremists, you know, all movements, any movement is going to attract its extremists. Now, people like me, independent voters, we tend to congregate as independents because we tend to be more middle of the road. And once upon a time, uh, neither party really had a monopoly on, on left or right. There were left and right elements within either party. But now the Republicans have gone so it, pretty far to the right. But the general perception is that the Democrats are becoming more and more in control of, of their left-wing extremists. So that would concern me as a middle-of-the-road guy, if that's true. So, uh, and it tends to be the perception. I mean, you see it written about all the time, even in the mainstream press. So as a middle-of-the-road guy, uh, am, am I somebody that's going to have a place and be welcome in the party? And will I be able to make a difference in that kind of scenario? Well, yeah, I, uh, I say yes because I disagree with a couple things, and I'll explain why. Because I'm one of those guys, and I'm talking as the chair of the county party. I'll come back to that. But this idea that the independent could be one party that they all sit in the middle, uh, as you know, isn't really accurate. And what we found in talking to a lot of voters or a lot of non-voters, and that's part of the challenge is getting people engaged, is that the independents fall also across the whole spectrum. Uh, I've talked to many people who have left the Republican Party because the Republican Party is not conservative enough for them. Yep, I, I've heard that too. And, and I've heard the same on the far left of Democrats, that the Democratic Party isn't progressive enough for them. So they become independents. And you have some who just uh, don't engage enough or don't, or don't bother to educate themselves about the issues, and so they don't register anywhere and don't get any information or reject all the information. I know other folks who uh, have kind of moved to the middle, but they're not comfortable jumping to the other party, and I understand it. There is that middle group, but but it's all across the spectrum. That's why I say I think if, if there was ever an independent party convention, uh, it would have to be held in separate rooms. Well, it's because we're all a bunch <laughs> of, uh, you know, individualists 
But you know, you know where I'm coming from when I say they tend to be. Uh, and, and for instance, you know, an article in the Arizona Daily Star this morning, they caught a cat named uh, Jim Haynes, who is president of something called Behavior Research Center. Um, and he, he expressed the view that I hear expressed a lot. He says, you know, people, uh, those who've opted to register as independents and have moved away from either party, generally are more likely to be moderate. So that, I guess that's uh, than, than what he calls the true believers in each camp. And, you know, as a moderate, I just want to know that I'm going to be in a party that uh, is going to listen to what I have to say. Now, you already did address that. You already said, yes, we will listen to you. We're diverse. We listen. And that's, that's, the, answer, that's the kind of answer I'm looking for. Um, yeah. Republicans gave the same answer, so I'm just uh, I'm right now I'm, I'm looking for something that's going to convince me. You uh, know? Let me let me exp- let me give you an example of how we practice what we preach because uh, I'm sure, and, and I know my counterpart says that, uh, but, but let me give you an example. Uh, and I kind of agree with what you said ju- just previously that yeah, they're probably more moderate within the independent party than not, and I'm sorry, among independents. However, they're also less likely to vote and less likely to be in. To be engaged. Right, so and they're less, again, they're less likely the, to have a handle that's going to engage. The challenge the opportunity here is to, uh, to become engaged and, and have your voice heard and, and play a role in whatever changes occur. Uh, you ask, can someone like you fit in the Democratic Party? If I can, you can. Uh, I'm one of those folks who believe, uh, as you just described, I believe in women's reproductive rights. I believe in individual rights to marry who you love. I believe in protecting the rights of voters and expanding the opportunity for all folks, minorities, the elderly, to have greater access uh, to voting. What we saw in Arizona this past year is an attempt by the other party, the majority Republicans in the legislature and from the governor, to restrict voting. And it was a popular uprising that overturned that. I'm referring to HB 2305 previous year. Uh, So I believe in in all of those things and protecting individual freedoms. But I believe in opportunity, too. I'm a small, I'm white, 50s, uh, male, small business owner. And I found that the Democratic Party reflects my beliefs uh, when it comes to fiscal responsibility and creating opportunity from what's now called the middle out rather than the top down uh, to provide economic policies that work for folks at, at, at all levels uh, to respect small business owners. We're 90 to 95 percent of the economic engine in Arizona. Uh, what, I, what I have always seen on the other side is the support for big business and tax breaks uh, what we believe is in that rising economic tide that lifts all boats, not just the yachts. And so that's why I felt more comfortable as a small business owner that, yeah, Democrats are, are really do fight for uh, economic policies that are that make sense. And, and that's been proven over the years, from Kennedy to Clinton to even the present, is that it's the Democrats that are more effective at balancing budgets. Uh, because we're dealing with the realities of both business owners and those in our community that are in need, that need social services. And we recognize that boosting the bottom, those folks, is good economic policy and makes sense rather than pretending they don't exist. Uh, The same is true for boosting and supporting public education, realizing that doing that provides for uh, better skilled employees and workers. Uh, I ran, ran a service business, professional behavioral health, workplace consulting and training. So I needed trained, experienced folks, and and that mattered. And I think the other, uh, another key difference, and, and one of the reasons that I'm so proud to be a Democrat, is that we take the long-term view in terms of what's right for the country and even what's right for the community. Our best example was just last weekend with the streetcar. Uh, it took government investment, this was, as well as private investment, but that was government-public-private partnership at its best the way it ought to work, which has already produced hundreds of jobs and boosted the local economy. Uh, it, it helps with conservation and uh, moving to alternatives in a way that is also helping the community and creating jobs. That's the kind of innovation that we're looking at. You know, it's been very uh, controversial down here, too, because uh, a lot of people have uh, are severe critics of the streetcar, and I think that it remains to be seen exactly how what the success rate is going to be compared to the, the cost. But I will certainly agree to you, with you that it's, it seems to have had an immediate beneficial effect. Let me circle back around to, um, uh, to something that also very much concerns me as a, as a voter, and that is the deficit. 
And it's left me very confused because uh, I, I'm, I'm massively concerned about what's happened to the federal deficit under Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. But yet I also have to acknowledge that the first trillion dollar deficit was under the uh, Republican Party uh, a president that, that preceded this one. And I've, I've never really been happy with the performance of any uh, Republic, any administration, Democrat or Republican, in terms of the deficit. Um, I also have to acknowledge that Bill Clinton is one of the mo- one of the very few that really seemed to actually address the deficit and get somewhere with it. So help me with this. Is there a party that actually is going to, A, be concerned about the deficit, and B, do something about it? And if so, is that is that you guys? I think we've proven that. Uh, there was a report out last week that the deficit is actually now shrinking under President Obama, who came in to office with unprecedented, I think except for the Great Depression, unprecedented challenges coming out of the uh, the Bush recession, which was the worst since 1982, having to pay for two wars uh, and, and deal with all that, along with the massive tax cuts for the top 1%, and, and yet uh, incredible unemployment, and yet now we see unemployment down, jobs increasing, I think, every month for, I, I've lost count of how many months, uh, over two years. Yes, yeah, the trend, is, the trend has been at, uh, so these policies uh, of the Democrats and looking at paying our bills, uh, you remember the fight uh, not very long ago to shut down the government. Oh, yeah, they didn't want to definitely pay do, bills and I'm definitely incurred. not in favor of shutting down the government under any circumstances. You're going you're gonna to borrow and make a disaster happen now in the name of presenting a, uh, preventing a disaster later. It makes no sense. Right. So it's those kinds of economic decisions that uh, not only deal with the present, but deal with the future. You know, when we're talking about Economics. We're also looking at economic security, and that's making sure that Social Security is still there, that Medicare is still there, and, and support providing that kind of ongoing, not just safety net, but uh, keeping a promise to the American people. And all that ties into the economic policies. Uh, what what you don't hear the Republicans talking about anymore is when the president came in, he also. Uh, created the the loan to GM, which was called a, a bailout, but in reality it has uh, been paid back and, and actually put more back into the U.S. coffers. So, and it kept the auto industry and I don't know how many tens of thousands of jobs alive, right. which so, then fed back into our uh, our revenue. Some things the so, president has done, uh, you know, I really. Excited, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go, go ahead. This is this is your forum, so don't let me don't let me interrupt you. Go ahead and say what you say. <laughs> No, I was, I was just saying that sometimes these are, are details in terms of economic policy, but they're sound details that produce that that positive outcome. And I think Democrats have, have shown that again and again uh, on a national level and certainly would like the opportunity to demonstrate that on the state level as well. All right. Well, one thing I'm looking for, and I'm just not hearing it from anybody, and maybe maybe this is your chance to tell me I'm just not listening closely enough, but I, the deficit scares the hell out of me because looking forward at the things that could happen, uh, if the United States government ever defaults on its debt and, the, and the, the full faith and credit of the United States government, which is the only thing that holds up the dollar, it has no intrinsic value. If that ever goes away, the consequences would be unimaginable. And that scares me. And I don't get the sense that other politicians are as scared as I am. The Tea Party, I get. They're, they're scared, but sometimes I think they're about half crazy. But I, what I'm looking for is a mainstream politician to say, yeah, we're scared too, and we're actually going to do something about this. That's not what I hear. I hear more passion for... Uh, extending entitlements and 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 doing things to um, to give more money to people and less and less concern all the time about where the money is going to come from. So so help me with this. Number one, a am, am I irrational in my fears, or am I just not listening to anybody who's trying to tell me that we're going to take care of this? Because it it really concerns me. Uh, always valid concern, but I think there have been answers, and, and I have to. Uh, again, take you back just a few years to where one of the darlings of the Tea Party, Dick Cheney, was quoted as saying, deficits don't matter. Um, and so that, that tells you about uh, the other party right there. Uh, on on this side, yeah, it's campaign season, so you and I both are hearing a lot of promises from a lot of folks. Sure, yeah. No one wants to say they're scared. They all want to say they're confident they have a plan. But when you look at the plans, you have to look at what's realistic and, and what makes sense for the population uh, as a whole. Uh, you know, Democrats understand that you can't just cut your way to prosperity. You need an economy that does create jobs, 
uh, but it's not built on kind of risky financial promises. You have to have sound policies, whether it's protecting the future of Medicare or Social Security. And, and I, I think that it's been proven again and again that sound democratic fiscal policies have worked. And, and that's what we're talking again, not just tax cuts to, to the wealthy, but if there's any kind of tax cuts, they have to be tied to incentives. They have to be tied to direct benefit to the population. Now, let's look at Arizona. Uh, the Republican legislature here and the governor have signed away millions in tax cuts for out-of-state corporations uh, without any promises or requirements to create jobs in Arizona, sure. to create an yeah. investment to make a difference. That's not sound economic policy. Uh, let's provide some of those tax incentives for local industry, for local businesses. That's what Democrats want, so that that money is returned right into the economy and increased because you, you're providing consumers with more buying power, uh, you know, able to pay more, uh, their fair share of taxes. And that's what the Democrats are looking at is really a fair tax plan okay. uh, where let everyone me, plays by the same rules. Let That's me have you pause different. just for a second, because if you can hang on with us, I'd like to go ahead and take a commercial break and get it out of the way so we have more um, more time to talk. Uh, about three minutes worth of worth of messages. And then I also want to say to our listeners, our, our phones have, have lighted up a couple times here. Uh, I will take some calls after the interview, but uh, not during the interview, because I wanted to go ahead and let uh, uh, Mr. Jorgensen have, uh, have his say, same as we did for the Democratic Party. Uh, excuse me, the Republican Party chairman. So, so uh, Don, if you can hang on for just a minute, and we'll be right Look back. Forward to it. All right, thank you. Okay, we're back on the Forest Car Show, the Bashful Bloviator, and we're going to forego our normal music break to uh, get right back to it. And uh, and Don, thanks for hanging with us through the uh, through the break. We can't sure. uh, not have a conversation about the border. Uh, I have concerns. I'm like my my politics, as I've said, are middle of the road. So I believe we have to do something to accommodate the people that uh, are wanting to come here, because this is an immigrant nation after all, and, um, and also the rising tide of violence uh, in the Central American countries is a documented fact. We know that that's true. So I think we've got to do something. I also think there should be limits, and I'm very concerned right now that uh, the rule of law is just being completely ignored at our border. So what's your answer to that, and, and what would be your position as to why the Democratic Party's uh, views on this uh, make it the party for me? Because, again, I think the Democrats are the only party that has proposed a realistic response uh, with regard to the comprehensive immigration plan that a bipartisan Senate approved, uh, but the House uh, Republican-led House majority will not even consider and look at. Uh, because, you, yeah, you're absolutely right, and I think most Americans understand that. There's several parts to this. On the one side, you have the legitimate issue of security, from drugs, from weapons flowing uh, across the border, uh, from folks uh, wanting to come over, you know, and um, and work without going through the process. Uh, we need, and that's where the common sense immigration policy comes in. A- and also to deal with, again, the, the 11, 12 million that are in the shadows here in the U.S., kind of forced into a second-class economy where they're not getting the benefit of their work and the and the US isn't getting the benefit of their work through them paying taxes like the rest of us on these jobs. Uh, the idea that they're taking jobs that Americans don't want is uh, usually proven false, particularly when you look at the vegetables and fruit rotting in the fields of California and even Arizona because uh, they can't find Americans to take those jobs, even at nineteen, twenty dollars an hour. So you have that, that side, which is a realistic issue of security, and also dealing with the reality of the folks here. And the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Plan dealt with deals with that very effectively. The the other issue related there is the Dreamers, and uh, the Dream Act. I think is one of the, the smartest moves of the the current president, a Democrat, you know, President Obama, in dealing with reality, that these are kids who are in the U.S. through no fault of their own. They they want to fight for this country. They want to be educated and work and be productive citizens in this country. And uh, we need to provide a path for that. And, and that's another way that uh, we're dealing with it from a humanitarian perspective and a common-sense, positive economic perspective. And so I think that's one of the differences. Rather than just say, send them back when there is no back to go to, or, you know, get rid of the 11 million, which, you know, 
they're not going to all show up for buses and self-deport, I think, as our governor said. So that's reality number one. Reality number two is the current issue with, as you said, the, the women and minors and unaccompanied minors coming across from Central America. This is, this is an immigration issue, yes, but it's a humanitarian crisis, and we have to look at it in both ways. And I think you know, the U.S. has responded, for the most part, besides all the just ridiculous uh, screaming from the other side to just send them back across the border. Well, you know, if you're doing that, you're consigning a number of children to death, and I don't want to uh, to sugarcoat that. We have to look at what is the right thing to do, and, and I think the plan right now is the right thing to do, but more has to be done. Uh, the president's $3.7 billion request uh, is sitting in Congress right now. Uh, Republicans aren't acting on that. To look at ways to beef up uh, the response to that. As you know, the president is subject to a 2008 law signed by President Bush to deal with these children as refugees, uh, to provide the opportunity to go to court and have that decision made before just sending them back to an unknown, dangerous uh, land or dangerous future. Uh, I think it, it makes sense to speed that process up because it is not effective right now. It was never intended for 50,000 or 60,000 uh, minors flooding the system. So we need more judges. We need quicker response in adjudicating those cases and a plan to return those that, that are not here for humanitarian reasons. Right. Uh, I see Democrats producing real answers, real plans to do that. And also, uh, and we've heard from several Democrats in, in the House and Senate and the President himself, they're open to negotiating and discussing that uh, and are still calling on the Republicans to do more than just, uh, uh, you know, yell and, and throw up slogans without answers. Right. So well, I think that's a, the real difference. It's not, my, it's not my purpose here to debate, so I'm not going to challenge you on anything you said, but I will just say that at, you know, as a as a, a voter, my concern is just that there should be limits. Existing law uh, laid out limits. Existing law is being ignored. So I have a hard time understanding how uh, changing the existing laws, which are being ignored, is going to help. But let me just let me just throw this out. Me, you know. Let me ask which which laws you're referring to that are being ignored. Well, just just the uh, the fact that, um, uh, for instance, the you have people coming over right now. Um, that are uh, showing up and being given basically they, the, nor, under normal circumstances they would go into detention and they're not and they're just basically giving but get, being given bus tickets and things like that you also have uh, the dreamers and I, I hear what you're saying about the dreamers it does really concern me that I have a president who's just by executive fiat uh, decided to carve out this exemption in the law it seems to me that's why we created Congress is to is to do that. But again, I don't want to debate you. Uh, that's not that's not my. <laughs> well, that's yeah, not we, my, uh, we we did create Congress to work, and uh, when one party refuses to work, the president had no choice. Well, yeah. I, again, not going to debate you. I just want to say that okay. that's, that's my concern. And um, yeah. um, let me just ask you where you stand on this, because I've had I've had people I've had a lot of callers on the show discussing this issue, and I've had some politicians on the show discussing this issue. Uh, seems to me that there are there's a whole spectrum of philosophies here. On the far right, we need to build a wall of China. Anybody that pops their head up above it, we shoot them. Okay, that's the far, 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 far right. <laughs> on the far, far, that, far, not far that left. Far when you look at what some of the candidates. Sometimes it seems. Like, oh yeah, and I've seen there. There are candidates that are running for office right here in Arizona that tell you that we need to deport all of the 11 million who are currently here, yeah. which doesn't and strike me walls, as practical as a middle of the road and, guy. And doesn't that, yeah. yeah, it doesn't strike me as practical as a middle of the road guy. But a lot of people believe that. Okay, so on the other end are people that say. Uh, the United States has a moral imperative, and I've seen that with those words used a lot, including in uh, uh, editorials in newspapers. We have a moral imperative to lead the world, to to invite people in who live in a bad place. And that bothers me, because the, most of the rest of the world is a bad place. And it seems to me that if we just let wave everybody on in, we're going to become a bad place, too. Now, I had, I had uh, a local councilman on the week before last whom i actually have a lot of for whom i have a lot of respect and i asked him that question i said okay we got the people right now declaring themselves as refugees i personally believe that a lot of them are simply gaming the system we, we won't know without hearings to which they are due but bottom line is uh they're coming they're going to and the more you let in the more they're going to keep coming what's the limit and his answer he didn't even blink he says you know I, that's not my problem my problem is to deal with those who are here now so taking all of that putting it in a big pot stirring it all around 
Uh, what does the Democratic Party say about whether there should be limits, what the limits should be, how we deal with all this without becoming a colony of uh, Honduras or Guatemala or El Salvador? Should there be limits? Absolutely. You know, we, again, have to be realistic. And, and what you described are the two extremes. And what's typical in the U.S. is find a, a workable middle ground. And Democrats are willing to do that. As I mentioned earlier, the president said, here is his $3.7 billion plan to address this issue. You know, we have to do something and take action. And if you, uh, the Republicans don't want to approve that, come up with uh, a reasonable alternative and let's talk. And if you need to tweak it, fine. Uh, because I agree, we have to move on that. As you say, uh, there are some of these folks who are legitimate refugees. Uh, there are many who pro- who aren't. We right. know that. Yeah, we know that. Let's let's follow our law, which says to give them you know a day before a judge or time before a judge to make that case. And if they make it, great. Then we will protect those refugees or, or assist them. Uh, but let's not just send everyone back uh, and say sorry. You know, uh, we're, we're going to send back the Statue of Liberty and what it says on that and just ignore folks. Oh, so I, I, was quoting that, I was quoting that plaque just oh. last week because, yes, the conserv- a lot of conservatives would love to just scrape that plaque right off the statue. Yeah, they would. It's like, oh, we really didn't mean it. Right. But the reality is, yeah, let's again invest the money in dealing with this issue now. So those that have a legitimate concern, uh, you know, uh, let's act as humanitarians and address that. Those that don't, yes, let's find a safe way to return them to their country. Yeah, well, you just uh, made a, a key but statement. But not just send them all back and, and wash our hands of it. That's not, right. uh, frankly, that's not the American way. That's not how this country was founded, and that's not who we are today. Well, you're talking about a couple of things that do appeal to me as a middle-of-the-road guy. You're talking about due process. That appeals to me. You also made a key admission or a key statement, I should say. We shouldn't call it an admission. But when you, when you said that um, we know some of the folks are gaming the system, um, I quoted a poll on my show, and I, now if I, were, if I were a better journalist, I could, I could remember the source off the top of my head. I can't, but it was a, a poll of uh, people who are coming across the border, and about 58% cited violence as a reason. There's a report on the Drudge Report this morning that says that uh, it is the Drudge Report, so you have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's talking about how smugglers have taught uh, those coming across, what to say, how to game the system. But we, on the other hand, we know that the violence in, in Central America, some of it's very well documented. So some of them probably gaming the system. Yet it just drives me nuts as a uh, as a journalist, somebody who spent 33 years in TV news, that every time I read a story about immigration, the, the journalists are always just tossing out their fleeing violence as if that's a universal truth. So it's a little bit refreshing to hear somebody say, yeah, that may not be the universal truth and we should... We should keep that in mind as we're as we're doing the due process that we're talking about. So I c- congratulate you right. on that statement. And now let me ask you this one, because one of the things that you've talked about, and I've heard it, you know, we talked about this with uh, Carolyn Cox last week too, that really, really concerns me as a middle of the road cat. All right, is the just the the gridlock, the abominable gridlock, which it seems to me started with Obamacare, because which was passed without a single Republican vote. Where do we go now from there? Because one of the things that I am intensely interested in as a voter is sending people to Congress that can figure out a way to move us past the gridlock. It seems to me there's, only, there's one of only two ways to move past it. Either one, the American people in their wisdom see fit to award dominance to one party or another, or we fit, send people to Washington that are going to figure out a way to work with one another again, like they used to seem to be able to do. What's your answer to that? How do you see a path going forward from there? Boy, it, you know, it's tough to give a, a, a short answer and not sound trite or too general. But but I've got to share something that I, I'm sure you're aware of, but a lot of people aren't, that the night of the uh, President Obama's inauguration, you had the key Republican leaders uh, in Congress, and I didn't know this till a few months ago when I read about this. Uh, Boehner, and many of the other leaders, McConnell, uh, uh, even Newt Gingrich, some others outside Congress, all got together and made the decision to do everything they could at every step to block this president from having any success. Their goal is to make him a one-term president. Their goal was to block any initiative so that he would have any kind of legacy. Uh, I thought that was, you know, myth or legend until I heard Newt Gingrich acknowledge that that happened. So why did uh, why was there such a fight over Obamacare? Because they didn't want Obama to have any success. 
uh, even if it kept 12 million even today who now have health care that didn't have it before. So the change is to hold these folks accountable uh, who are not willing to work with the other party, whichever it is. If, Dem- if a Democrat steps up and says, I won't compromise with, with Republicans under any circumstances, vote for someone else. Uh, when you have Republicans saying, I would rather shut down government than work with the Democrats or look at reasonable alternatives, uh, it's time to vote for a Democrat. Uh, when I have, when you have uh, legislators in our state Senate and state House who shut the doors to Democrats rather than to consider their bills or to involve them in, in budget considerations, it's time for a change there. So I say, uh, hold these individuals accountable. That's the only way we're going to have change. The problem now is, as you know, there are fewer and fewer uh, radio stations like this one and shows like yours that invite both sides to speak. Now, right. We used That's to hear the that same news. We used to have the same discussions. Now you have discussions just on Fox with people who only listen to Fox, only uh, believe what, what they're told there. They do no fact-checking. Uh, I'm sure there's the same on the other side that only listen to MSNBC. I believe that's all true. Oh, it's definitely yes, true. You know, I'm a Democrat. However, I watch both, uh, and I listen to both to yeah, at least too. understand what I've got, the other I've got a long blog from. entry on my blog about this very thing. And, I, I, and you know, and I, I do believe Americans ultimately, even though what you just said is absolutely true, Ultimately, Americans can figure this out because if they couldn't, then, you know, Fox News by now would have succeeded in putting a Republican president and a Republican House and a Republican Senate in place. And they haven't done that. So I think that's, that's because a, that's a, yeah, Americans that's a great can figure it out. Check. Yeah. Let me one last question and then we're going to have to we're going to have to wrap this up. But one of the things that really, 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 really concerns me as a journalist and as a citizen, both is the lack of answers we're able to get right now from the Obama administration and specifically on immigration. And it just drives me insane that uh, reporters' questions about exactly what's happening at the border are being deflected. So I don't mean to turn this into an immigration question per se. So let me just ask, in general, uh, do you think the Democratic Party shares that concern about government openness? Do you think the Obama administration has kept its promise in general to be the most transparent administration ever? Or do you think that changes are needed to make it more transparent and would the Democratic Party... Uh, is that the party for me if I think that those changes need to happen? Yeah, that's about three different questions. Let me answer them in a different order. I think the Obama administration has been one of the most transparent in history because of the, the media, because of all the different um, methods we have of getting the word out, electronic, social, etc. Having said that, even though they have been the mm-hmm. most transparent, it's it's not enough. It has not been enough. And, and I... Uh, I'm one who believes strongly, and certainly in our county, in our state, and I hope at the national level, Democratic Party believes the more transparency, the better. Uh, And so I think there has to be much more done uh, in this area. Uh, I think it's no secret that the Obama administration has not done a good job in communications. Even when they have had great successes, they haven't done a great job. And so there needs to be much improvement there. Okay, I really appreciate you joining us today, and we do have to wrap it up. You have been very generous with your time, and I think you've been an excellent spokesperson. And I got, you know, just speaking personally, I got a lot to think about now as I decide whether I want to get off the fence and declare a party loyalty because both, I think both parties uh, have said, had a lot of good things to share just recently. But you, you did a really good job. I appreciate you taking so much time to be with us today. Well, you're welcome in our party, and uh, it's been a pleasure. It, I, I don't get the bashful part of your uh, <laughs> well, uh, blog, my, my but, social uh, my social hey, life anytime. testifies to that. But uh, but yeah, I can be pretty outspoken when I'm sitting here by myself in front of a microphone. <laughs> so uh, it's been a pleasure. It, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Don.